Chapter Twenty Seven of Great Expectations. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter Twenty Seven. My dear Mr. Pip, I write this by request of Mr. Gargory, for to let you know that he is going to London in company with Mr. Wopsle and would be glad, if agreeable, to be allowed to see you. He would call at Barnard's Hotel, Tuesday morning, nine o'clock, when, if not agreeable, please leave word. Your poor sister is much the same as when you left. We talk of you in the kitchen every night, and wonder what you are saying and doing. If now considered in the light of a liberty, excuse it for the love of poor old days. No more, dear Mr. Pip, from your ever obliged and affectionate servant, Biddy. P.S. He wishes me most particular to write what larks. He says you will understand. I hope, and do not doubt, it will be agreeable to see him, even though a gentleman, for you had ever a good heart, and he is a worthy, worthy man. I have read him all, excepting only the last little sentence, and he wishes me most particular to write again what locks. I received this letter by the post on Monday morning, and therefore its appointment was for next day. Let me confess exactly with what feelings I looked forward to Joe's coming. Not with pleasure, though I was bound to him by so many ties. No with considerable disturbance, some mortification, and a keen sense of incongruity. If I could have kept him away by paying money, I certainly would have paid money. My greatest reassurance was that he was coming to Barnard's Inn, not to Hammersmith, and consequently would not fall in Bentley Drummle's way. I had little objection to his being seen by Herbert, or his father, for both of whom I had a respect but I had the sharpest sensitiveness as to his being seen by Drummle, whom I held in contempt. So, throughout life, our worst weaknesses and meannesses are usually committed for the sake of the people whom we most despise. I had begun to be always decorating the chambers in some quite unnecessary and inappropriate way or other, and very expensive those wrestles with Barnard proved to be. By this time the rooms were vastly different from what I had found them and I enjoyed the honour of occupying a few prominent pages in the books of a neighbouring upholsterer. I had got on so fast of late that I had even started a boy in boots, top boots, in bondage and slavery to whom I might have been said to pass my days. For after I had made the monster, out of the refuse of my washerwoman's family, and had clothed him with a blue coat, canary waistcoat, white cravat, creamy breeches, and the boots already mentioned. I had to find him a little to do, and a great deal to eat, and with both of those horrible requirements he haunted my existence. This avenging phantom was ordered to be on duty at eight on Tuesday morning in the hall. It was two feet square, as charged for four-cloth, and Herbert suggested certain things for breakfast that he thought Joe would like. While I felt sincerely obliged to him for being so interested and considerate, I had an odd, half-provoked sense of suspicion upon me, that if Joe had been coming to see him, he wouldn't have been quite so brisk about it. However, I came into town on Monday night to be ready for Joe, and I got up early in the morning, and caused the sitting-room and breakfast-table to assume their most splendid appearance. Unfortunately, the morning was drizzly, and an angel could not have concealed the fact that Barnard was shedding sooty tears outside the window like some weak giant of a sweep. As the time approached, I should have liked to run away. But the avenger pursuant to orders was in the hall, and presently I heard Joe on the staircase. I knew it was Joe, by his clumsy manner of coming upstairs, his state boots being always too big for him, and by the time it took him to read the names on the other floors in the course of his ascent. When at last he stopped outside our door, 
I could hear his finger tracing over the painted letters of my name, and I afterwards distinctly heard him breathing in at the keyhole. Finally, he gave a faint single rap, and Pepper, such was the compromising name of the avenging boy, announced, "'Mr. Gorgory!' I thought he never would have done wiping his feet, and that I must have gone out to lift him off the mat. But at last he came in. "'Joe! How are you, Joe?' "'Pip! How air you, Pip?' With his good honest face all glowing and shining, and his hat put down on the floor between us, he caught both my hands, and worked them straight up and down, as if I had been the last patented pump. "'I am glad to see you, Joe. Give me your hat.' But Joe, taking it up carefully with both hands, like a bird's nest with eggs in it, wouldn't hear of parting with that piece of property, and persisted in standing talking over it in a most uncomfortable way. "'Which you have that growed,' said Joe, "'and that swelled, and that gentle folked. Joe considered a little before he discovered this word. "'As to be sure, you are a honour to your king and country. "'And you, Joe, look wonderfully well.' "'Thank God,' said Joe. "'I'm equable to most. "'And your sister, she's no worse than she were. "'And Biddy, she's ever right and ready. "'And all friends is no backerder, if not no forrader. "'Sutton Wopsle, he's had a drop.' All this time, still with both hands taking great care of the bird's nest, Joe was rolling his eyes round and round the room, and round and round the flowered pattern of my dressing-gown. "'Had a drop, Joe?' "'Why, yes,' said Joe, lowering his voice. "'He's left the church, and went into the play-acting, which the play-acting have likewise brought him to London along with me. And his wish were—' said Joe, getting the bird's nest under his left arm for the moment, and groping in it for an egg with his right. "'If no offence, as I would, and you that.' I took what Joe gave me, and found it to be the crumpled playbill of a small metropolitan theatre, announcing the first appearance in that very week of the celebrated provincial amateur of Roskin Renown whose unique performance in the highest tragic walk of our national bard has lately occasioned so great a sensation in local dramatic circles. "'Were you at his performance, Joe?' I inquired. "'I were,' said Joe, with emphasis and solemnity. "'Was there a great sensation?' "'Why?' said Joe. "'Yes, there certainly were a peck of orange peel.' particular when he see the ghost, though I put it to yourself, sir, whether it were calculated to keep a man up to his work with a good heart, to be continually cutting in betwixt him and the ghost with our men. A man may have had a misfortune, and been in the church," said Joe, lowering his voice to an argumentative and feeling tone, "'but that is no reason why you should put him out at such a time which I mean to say, if the ghost of a man's own father cannot be allowed to claim his attention, what can, sir? Still more, when his mourning hat is unfortunately made so small as that the weight of the black feathers brings it off, try to keep it on how you may." A ghost-seeing effect in Joe's own countenance informed me that Herbert had entered the room. So I presented Joe to Herbert who held out his hand, but Joe backed from it, and held on by the bird's nest. "'Your servant, sir,' said Joe, "'which I hope, as you and Pip—' Here his eye fell on the Avenger, who was putting some toast on table, and so plainly denoted an intention to make that young gentleman one of the family, that I frowned it down, and confused him more. "'I meet her say, you two gentlemen—' which I hope as you get your else in this close spot. For the present may be a very good inn, according to London opinions," said Joe, confidentially, and I believe his character do stand I. But 
I wouldn't keep a pig in it myself. Not in the case that I wish him to fatten wholesome, and to eat with a mellow flavour on him. Having borne this flattering testimony to the merits of our dwelling-place, and having incidentally shown his tendency to call me Sir, Joe, being invited to sit down to table, looked all around the room for a suitable spot on which to deposit his hat, as if it were only on some very few rare substances in nature that it could find a resting-place, and ultimately stood it on an extreme corner of the chimney-piece, from which it ever afterwards fell off at intervals. "'Do you take tea or coffee, Mr. Gargery?' asked Herbert, who always presided of a morning. "'Thank ye, sir,' said Joe, stiff from head to foot. "'I'll take whichever is most agreeable to yourself.' "'And what do you say to coffee?' "'Thank ye, sir,' returned Joe, evidently dispirited by the proposal. "'Since you are so kind as make choice of coffee, I will not run contrary to your opinions. But don't you never find it a little eating?" "'Say tea, then,' said Herbert, pouring it out. Here Joe's hat tumbled off the mantelpiece, and he started out of his chair and picked it up, and fitted it to the same exact spot, as if it were an absolute point of good breeding that it should tumble off again soon. "'When did you come to town, Mr. Gargery?' "'Were it yesterday afternoon?' said Joe, after coughing behind his hand, as if he had had time to catch the whooping cough since he came. "'No, it were not. Yes, it were. Yes, it were yesterday afternoon,' with an appearance of mingled wisdom, relief, and strict impartiality. "'Have you seen anything of London yet?' "'Why, yes, sir,' said Joe. "'Me and Wopsle went off straight to look at the black and wear us. But we didn't find that it come up to its likeness in the red bills of the shop doors, which I mean to say, added Joe, in an explanatory manner, as it is there drawed to architectural rural. I really believe Joe would have prolonged this word, mightily expressive to my mind of some architecture that I know, into a perfect chorus, but for his attention being providentially attracted by his hat, which was toppling. Indeed, it demanded from him a constant attention, and a quickness of eye and hand, very like that exacted by wicket-keeping. He made extraordinary play with it, and showed the greatest skill, now rushing at it and catching it neatly as it dropped, now merely stopping it midway, beating it up, and humouring it in various parts of the room, and against a good deal of the pattern of the paper on the wall, before he felt it safe to close with it. Finally, splashing it into the slop-basin, where I took the liberty of laying hands upon it. As to his shirt-collar and his coat-collar, they were perplexing to reflect upon, insoluble mysteries both. Why should a man scrape himself to that extent, before he could consider himself full-dressed? Why should he suppose it necessary to be purified by suffering for his holiday clothes? Then he fell into such unaccountable fits of meditation, with his fork midway between his plate and his mouth, had his eyes attracted in such strange directions, was afflicted with such remarkable coughs, sat so far from the table, and dropped so much more than he ate, and pretended that he hadn't dropped it, that I was heartily glad when Herbert left us for the city. I had neither the good sense nor the good feeling to know that this was all my fault, and that if I had been easier with Joe, Joe would have been easier with me. I felt impatient of him, and out of temper with him, in which condition he heaped coals of fire on my head. "'Us two be now alone, sir,' began Joe. "'Joe,' I interrupted pettishly, "'how can you call me sir?' Joe looked at me for a single instant, with something faintly like reproach. Utterly preposterous as his cravat was, and as his collars were, I was conscious of a sort of dignity in the look. "'Us two be now alone,' resumed Joe, "'and me having the intentions and abilities to stay not many minutes more. I will now conclude, leastways begin, to mention what have led to my having had the present honour. 
For was it not, said Joe, with his old air of lucid exposition, that my only wish were to be useful to you, I should not have had the honour of breaking whittles in the company and abode of gentlemen. I was so unwilling to see the look again, that I made no remonstrance against its tone. "'Well, sir,' pursued Joe, "'this is how it were. "'I were at the bargeman t'other night, Pip.' Whenever he subsided into affection, he called me Pip, and whenever he relapsed into politeness, he called me Sir. "'When there come up in his shay-cart, Pumblechook, which that same identical, said Joe, going down a new track, do comb my hair the wrong way sometimes, awful, by giving out up and down town, as it were him which ever had your infant companionation, and were looked upon as a playfellow by yourself. Nonsense! It was you, Joe. Which I fully believe it were, Pip, said Joe, slightly tossing his head. Though it signify little now, sir. Well, Pip, this same identical, which his manners is given to blusterous, come to me at the bargeman. What a pipe, and a pint of beer, do give refreshment to the working man, sir, and do not overstimulate. And his word were, Joseph, Miss Havisham, she wished to speak to you. Miss Havisham, Joe? She wish, were Pumblechook's word, to speak to you. Joe sat and rolled his eyes at the ceiling. "'Yes, Joe. Go on, please. Next day, sir,' said Joe, looking at me as if I were a long way off. "'Having cleaned myself, I go and I see Miss A. "'Miss A, Joe? Miss Havisham? Which I say, sir,' replied Joe, with an air of legal formality, as if he were making his will. "'Miss A, or otherwise, Havisham, her expression air then as foreign. Mr. Gargery, you air in correspondence with Mr. Pip? Having had a letter from you, I were able to say, I am. When I married your sister, sir, I said, I will. And when I answered your friend Pip, I said, I am. Would you tell him, then, said she, that which Estella has come home and would be glad to see him? I felt my face fire up as I looked at Joe. I hope one remote cause of its firing may have been my consciousness that if I had known his errand, I should have given him more encouragement. "'Biddy,' pursued Joe, "'when I got home, and asked her for to write the message to you, a little hung back, Biddy says, "'I know he will be very glad to have it by word of mouth. It is holiday time.' You want to see him? Go." "'I have now concluded, sir,' said Joe, rising from his chair. "'And, Pip, I wish you ever well, and ever prospering, to a greater and greater height.' "'But you are not going now, Joe?' "'Yes, I am,' said Joe. "'But you are coming back to dinner, Joe?' "'No, I am not,' said Joe. Our eyes met and all the sir melted out of that manly heart as he gave me his hand. Pip, dear old chap, life is made of ever so many partings, welded together, as I might say, and one man's a blacksmith, and one's a whitesmith, and one's a goldsmith, and one's a coppersmith. Divisions among such must come, and must be met as they come. If there's been any fault at all to-day, it's mine. You and me is not two figures to beat together in London, nor yet anywheres else, but what is private, and be known, and understood among friends. It ain't that I'm proud, but that I want to be right, as you shall never see me no more in these clothes. I'm wrong in these clothes. I'm wrong out of the forge, the kitchen, or off of the meshes. You won't find half so much fault in me, if you think of me in my forge dress, with my hammer in my hand, or even my pipe. You won't find half so much fault in me, if, supposing as you should ever wish to see me, you come and 
put your head in at the forge window, and see Joe the blacksmith, there, at the old anvil, and the old burnt apron, sticking to the old work. I'm awful dull, but I hope I've beat out something nigh the rights of this at last. And so, God bless you, dear old Pip, old chap, God bless you. I had not been mistaken in my fancy that there was a simple dignity in him. The fashion of his dress could no more come in its way when he spoke these words than it had come in its way in heaven. He touched me gently on the forehead and went out. As soon as I could recover myself sufficiently, I hurried out after him and looked for him in the neighbouring streets. But he was gone. End of chapter 27